Well, welcome everyone and thank you so much, um, Commissioner of Education, Dr. Cardona and your, uh, your team for uh, joining us and listening to our teachers' voices. Um, we did this a couple weeks ago, probably a month or so ago now, um, with CEA, and we just wanted to circle back. I think where we were at that time was a lot different than where we are now. Um, and so we just wanted to touch base and have a chat with you about where you are, about the reopening, because we're hearing a lot of things from the uh, governor, and we just it's making our teachers a little bit uncomfortable. So we just wanted to have that face-to-face -face Zoom uh, conversation with you. So welcome. Um, you see everyone's name, just so you know, everyone here is on our pre-K-12 uh, committee. We have been meeting at least once a week, but usually about two, two, three times a week, talking about you know what what would make our educators feel safe going back to the classroom. So this is our our core group, if you will, um, and what we do, what we plan to do is, um, as Stuart said, record it and then share it with all of our other educators. So, with that, I'll I'll, I'll let you say a couple words. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I know we had this meeting scheduled. Uh, weeks ago and uh, we wanted to maintain uh, the schedule so uh, we can speak uh, with you and, and um, hear from you as well. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. Um, I see some familiar faces here. Uh, nice to see everyone, um, albeit through Zoom. It's nice to see you and, and be with you this morning. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have Deputy Commissioners Russell Tucker and Nesmith on the line as well. And uh, we're happy to be here. Great, thank you. So we'll jump right in. Um, I think folks know that I've been participating in the Education Reopen uh, Committee with you and others, and that seemed to um, have a pause, if you will. And I was just wondering if you would share with others, you know, where that committee stands, what we've done, and where we might be going. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the reopening advisory team was established by the governor uh, early on to have different perspectives, different voices, uh, in the conversation, we actually expanded it a little bit uh, once we got it going and we met three times a week uh, regularly. Um, we actually had to increase the meeting times. Um, this was in addition to the partner calls that we have at the agency with educational partners. So we have uh, AFT, CEA, CAPS, CABE, uh, CAS on the call uh, regularly. Um, but the reopening team that you referred to uh, has been meeting three, day, three days a week and um, in addition to that team, I'll go back to that, but in addition to that team, the State Department established uh, regional advisory teams because we know while Connecticut's pretty small, you can get through from one point to the other about two hours, COVID has affected regions of Connecticut differently, right? We know in Fairfield County, the numbers there uh, were much different than New London County or Wyndham County. So we wanted to hear from teachers, from principals, from parents, uh, from different areas in order to inform our, our thinking. So that regional team has been established, it's there. And similar to the reopen team that you, you talked about, uh, about a week and a half ago, we got to a point where we had to take all the feedback that we got, uh, everything that we listened to, and just really start writing based on what we've heard and what we, what we know um, to have some things for the governor to look at. And we've been working on that. Later today, we're, re, we're bringing them back together. Um, we had about a week or a week and a half to really just use literally those hours in the day with the team to, to do the writing. And we're hoping to have the team reconvene at two o'clock today to, to kind of share where we are and, and some high level points that we hope to um, share. Um, Jan has been very, not only, um, instrumental in sharing the various perspectives, but also keeping us informed with the fluid. You know, I think the meeting started with what happened, uh, what we knew a month ago is so different from now, right? And I think one of the constants with this whole thing, not only in education, but throughout is the fluidity of it. Um, and, and Jan has been keeping the reopening team up to date with the shift in thinking at times of where we are in the state and where teachers, uh, AFT teachers are um, so we're, we're prepared to have more information for the reopening team later on today. Uh, and, you know, we're going to continue that, the communication. I think it's important to share also, and I know you might've been asking this as well, that the reopening team is going to continue to have 
conversations about elements of reopening that we're going to need various input from. So they represent a good cross section and it'd be foolish for us not to continue to, to use the, the input from those folks uh, moving forward. Great. Desi or Charlene, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. You know, the, the, good morning, everyone. Hey, Jan. Good uh, morning. One thing I just, I would just add commissioner, you know, in, in a short amount of time in, in three months, I would just thank, you know, everybody who has partnered with us as, as we go down this path together. You know, when I think about the amount of work that has been done, everything from pivoting from in-person to online learning for kids in three months to all the committees that have happened, all the feedback that has been gathered and all of that to help inform the plan. I would just say thank you to um, everyone here and, and all of our different uh, stakeholders who have been a part of that. It's been a tremendous amount of, of work and a lift in three months. And um, I'm, I'm proud to, to be here and be a part of it with you. I would add my voice to that as well, Jen, and thank you. And I see folks on here who we've, we've talked with uh, as well, and it's so appreciative. And as the commissioner said, you know, it got to a point where you're getting all this feedback, now you had to do something with it. Uh, and in addition to hearing teachers' uh, voices, we also make space and heard uh, from family and community. And we just recently uh, are closing out a thought exchange where we had over 16,000 uh, students uh, responding to. So it's been a lot of information that they've shared with us uh, that we're really massaging uh, into what needs to, to happen going forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I think the, the question on everybody's mind is the governor started making statements um, last week about bringing everyone back to school, um, back to normal as much as possible, even if that means that there's 20 to 25 students per classroom. And I think all of our educators are concerned that how do we combine the needs of getting students back into the classroom with the science-based research and safety standards um, that we know that we all need. You know, we support the reopening of schools, but we strongly feel that just because we feel distance learning is not, you know, the, the adequate, adequate way to go about learning, but at the same time, not quite sure we are where the governor is. Can you comment on that? I didn't see um, the specific uh, thing you're referring to, but I know that, you know, in Connecticut, um, we, we want to make sure that safety precautions are definitely a part of all the thinking that we have. And that's why, you know, I wish I could have the plan out a month ago, right? So people can have something. But we're, we're working very closely with our partners at DPH to make sure that health and safety stay at the forefront of the conversations that we're having. Um, so that's something that hasn't changed. And I know when we, when we speak at the reopening team, we, you know, we always know that what we're planning has to be looked at through the lens of health and safety experts, which I'm not, and, and make sure that whatever we put in front of the governor has that as well. So I, I think you can know that that's the thinking that we have. And I think that's critically important for us, not only as educators, but as parents. Thank you. Um, the other question that continually comes up from our educators is, you know, will we have a single state standard um, for elements of reopening um, or will schools and districts be allowed to modify a structure that fits um, their students, their staff, the school community as a whole? Right. You know, it, it's interesting because we talk about fluidity and it, with the reopening team, I'm not going to speak just for myself, but from the reopening team, there was a lot of conversation over the last month about, you know, okay, should we have one model that goes across the whole state and what are the benefits of that? And then the shifting started to evolve a little bit um, because we know, let me just start off by saying there's never going to be a perfect model in any state, in any country. And any plan will have to continue to evolve based on what the trends are in that area. So it's, it's quite frankly, a very challenging task to put something forward and, and be able to say, listen, we're putting this out, but we know that with time it's gonna shift. What we do know is that districts know their communities better than the State Department of Education. And we wanna give the ability for districts to provide the input based on what their needs are, what their capacity is, what their building layout is, what, where the you know, districts differ so much. So to, to put out a plan that doesn't take that into account would be counter to what we've been trying to do over the last several months of gathering information. 
but I do, I do hear loud and clear from districts and from teachers is, you know, what are the parameters with which we do our planning? Um, we want to make sure that, as I said earlier, the health and safety uh, guidance guides consistently throughout the state of Connecticut so that when districts are looking at how to uh, reopen and how to plan and how to communicate, they, they have some security in knowing these are the provisions that we need to take into account. We also know that, um, as I mentioned earlier, what happens in Fairfield County or what you know, what they're thinking about in Fairfield County may be a little bit different than in Wyndham County based on the health data, that we give that opportunity for those local health departments and districts to have conversations about what's happening in their, their neck of the woods. I think that's the right way of doing it. Um, but we also want to strike that balance to say, you know, these are the things that you need to be thinking about. And th this is the science that's guiding this. I think that's critically important. Uh, and I think that's what they're asking for also. Okay, along those same lines, you know, um, I think the next question that comes to educators' mind is, you know, we'll have these um, standards for opening, um, but we have to assume also that there'll be standards for closing up again. Um, if a student becomes sick, an educator becomes sick, a community um, has a research, things like that. Um, and we know that not all students are going to want to return in the fall and not all parents are going to want to send their students back in the fall. So can you comment a little bit about those things? Sure. What we're hearing is, um, you know, the need for steps to close if there are increasing cases, right? Um, so what happens if I have one in one classroom? We should have some level of consistency in one community on this side of the state and another community on the other side of the state. So the response to that should be fairly consistent and based on what our partners in the health and safety field feel is the best way to mitigate spread. Um, so those are the details that we feel there should be some clarity for districts. Um, and that's what we're working on, making sure that th there's some clarity and consistency, I think is the, the right word uh, for that. Um, with regard to uh, students that are not returning, we also feel that some provision of um, having students who are learning from home needs to be a part of planning. Um, as we've noticed in plans throughout the world and throughout our country, there has to be some provision for those students that are not able to return for one reason or another. Um, but again, th these are some of the things that I don't think we at the State Department of Education have a crystal ball or have all the best answers. The best way to get the best results is to, to listen and, and put people together that have this as a specific topic to talk about what does this look like or what should we be following in, in accordance with law in accordance with the flexibility that might be needed in some areas or not um, and i think you know the reopening team or the, the regional teams are good examples of where those conversations could be had in greater detail with different input from different folks uh, the innovation really lies in our in our state in different pockets and what we're trying to do is put together a plan that provides guidance but also allows for district input and by district i mean various stakeholders in the, those districts to come together with some good ideas that we could then learn from. You know, we started our, our tenure, learn together, grow together, right? And, um, you know, that can't be more truer than, than now. Mm -hmm. We need to learn from one another. And, and that's why I'm on the call with, with different commissioners regularly. That's why I'm scouring through other plans. Um, we need districts and, and, and stakeholders like yourselves to be engaging in those conversations because some of the best answers are out there. People just need to be asked. So one of the things that this group has been um, talking about is the possibility of what a vision for TVAL going forward might look like for the, the, the calendar year. Um, and, you know, is that a possibility of having a collaborative discussion on, on what that will look like going forward? I'm sure Lauren would love that. <laughs> right, Lauren? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, Mary has been very good about uh, bringing that up in our meetings, uh, in our educational partner meetings, um, consistently. And, um, you know, one of the words that has come up a lot, we're thinking about how, how we utilize it in a meaningful way is, is reimagining. How do we reimagine um, so that elements of what we do is better than prior to COVID? Mm -hmm. You know, 2012 was a long time ago, right? 
Um, and we know that a lot has shifted in from 2012 till now and what we know about what works for educator support and evaluation. And um, I think it's time that we evolve with it. So I, I'm going to say that, yes, COVID is requiring that we look at semantics of how we implement TVAL next year, because you can't take last year or the year before's TVAL plan and plop it in next year. Okay. We didn't have standardized assessments at the end of the year. Um, you know, there's going to be a balance of remote. So how do you, and then we have to plan for the unknown. So it, it's, it's safe to say that we're not going to be able to just take what we did two years ago and plop it in next year. But I think it's also safe to say that we're due for higher level conversations about what do we want to see? How do we reimagine teacher evaluation and teacher support? And, you know, we hired um, Dr. Shawana Tucker um, to lead the, uh, the office, the talent office. Uh, as you know, that position was vacant for, for many months. Um, but we, we hired her and we, part of the hiring process was really examining, you know, we're ready now to have these conversations. We're ready to dust off that peak binder and get it going and, and talk about what's good for kids, what's good for educators. We talk a lot about evaluation and, and, and support, but we really focused more on evaluation. And you know, when we redo this, when we re reimagine it, we really need to think about uh, how to use it as a tool to support. Uh, especially now, teachers are gonna be asked to be experts in trauma, mm -hmm. social emotional learning, distance learning. These are all things that really rose. And how do we build in through our TVAL process um, a robust support mechanism so that it's not reliant on one to two PD days or, or the focus of the conversations when teachers sit with uh, evaluators is just on the, the 45 minute lesson or the 30 minute lesson. Like we need to think, we need to reimagine a system that works for, for educators. And quite frankly, you know, I know AFT was a part of the process when, when Peak was there. And because I sat in on those meetings, I was a part of Peak as well. But I really want this to be a good conversation about where can we go? How can we make it better? How can we make our plan the plan that we want to share and say we're proud of this? Yeah. Um, that is definitely one of the things that I think we're going we're gonna to need input from uh, AFT. And we look forward to that. So in the, in the process before we get there, do you, do you envision that um, it will kind of be in the suspended state that it's been in since March? I think we're going to, it's going to be, so there's a long term and I'm excited about the long term and then there's a the short term. What does it look like next year? So we are going to engage in conversations and we're going to, I know Mary's uh, going to be a part of that Great. to see what does it look like for next year? Um, you know, and I think there's going to be some, there has to be some balance. I mean, uh, we want to provide support for teachers and we want to have a system of, of, of evaluation, but we also know that the components of last year's plan are not possible next year. So with input from our, our partners, including AFT, we're going to come up with a, a process that makes sense. But as I, I listen to the conversation, I think about supporting teachers more broadly than, than just the TVAL piece. Um, I do want you to know we have been working on uh, what, what we're calling the CT Learning Hub. Um, many of you know we have been without a chief academic officer for far too long. And since bringing um, Irene Parisi on board, the academic office has really been um, ramping up to put out some high quality uh, resources that are content related for teachers and for students and for parents. And once that gets released, uh, it will be something that we continue to work on. Uh, and so it's going to be important for uh, teachers to be able to give us feedback on that and, and talk to us about what additional supports we want to make part of the learning hub going forward, whether we're you know, in class or not in class. That, that, I think that um, piece matters, but I think it, I want folks to understand we're working hard to make sure no matter what we're providing, high quality um, content and resources for our teachers and our, our educators, um, our students and our parents. And so that is something that we're going to release shortly. And as time goes on, we will continue to just make that better and better over time. So as we're talking about supporting teachers, I, I do want them to know that we have been working behind the scenes on that piece and look forward to uh, releasing that soon. Great, thanks, Debbie. And, and I'll also add to that, gents, and, and for all, you know the assessment is a part of that as well. So just so you know, internally, so it's the academic office or performance office, the folks who do assessment and our talent office, 
that together uh, is having these conversations and then we'll be getting the stakeholder involvement in those conversations as well. And I always add, then we have the student voices. They are telling us a lot. So, uh, uh, I, so I can just imagine how robust the conversation will be with, will be with everyone together looking at the path forward. Great. If I could just really piggyback off of that and then just, I want to share, um, you know, prior to COVID, one of our board meetings, we, we had a presentation about sensible assessments. You know, I think TVAL is one of those topics that we really need to kind of unpack again, and assessments is another one. And, you know, to what degree are we utilizing these assessments to help? I think we're in the process now of just kind of taking a step back and saying, you know, we were thinking about it prior to COVID, but now we really need to think about what do sensible assessment schedules look like? And uh, Ajit Gopalakrishnan is really leading that work to say, are we assessing for the sake of assessing on certain things? And what could we do to really be sensible about it? And, and that's the word we came up with, sensible assessments. Mm -hmm. um, so part and parcel with TVAL, we have to also think about we don't want to just create assessments so that TVAL could stay up floating, you know, and have we gotten into the culture of assessing because we need metrics for TVAL? Yep. And is that the approach that we want to take as a state? So the conversations when we talk about TVAL redesign or, or reimagining, we also have to take into account assessment reimagining. And wh why are we assessing? What is the purpose of it? What are we spending our money on, number one, too? Because right now, you know, we want to make sure we're, safe, we're protecting every dollar to support students the best we can. So what are we spending money on? Why are we using the assessments? And how can we be sensible about it? I think it's time for a conversation about that in Connecticut. Great. I just read this morning in the Washington Post. Actually, I printed it. I haven't read it yet. It's, but the headline is, it looks like the beginning of the end of America's obsession with student standardized testing. And I think I speak for all our teachers when we say, yeah. We went way, way overboard. So I, we, I think we would very much welcome that conversation yeah. about. You guys will be a part of the conversation. You know, you've been great partners, good thought partners in the process. And I think that's one of the things that we value most uh, at the agency, the fact that we can pick up the phone. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're always going to land on the same spot, but we can have good conversation and, and listen to various perspectives, especially because teachers, they see, you know, we could have an implementation thinking of what it looks like, but the teachers are the ones that are actually doing it. And they could tell us, this is what you're thinking, but this is what's, how it's being rolled out. So that's always helpful to have. Exactly. So just one other thing, Jan, I do know that as Ajit has worked with his folks in the performance office, we actually talked about this this weekend, he has looked nationally to see you know, what the trends are and what the latest research says. So I, I think when we roll out our, our sensible assessment um, you know, information, it, it, it will have been benchmarked against what we're seeing um, nationally in, in terms of trends as well. Thank you, thank you. So um, just want to kind of get back to the fall, uh, the plan. Um, a lot of questions about, you know, in the reimagined kind of arena, you know, is there a plan to have a state education calendar that is um, set for everyone now? Um, it makes it a lot easier for uh, educators that have children that are in different districts um, crossing lines. Now that we know that, you know, when the snow flies, it's easier just to say, okay, we're going to stay safe. We now know how to do um, distance learning, things like that. Just wanted to know your thoughts on those types of things. Sure. We have been having conversations about what strategies should we take now that we're in a position to rethink a lot of things. Um, calendars have come up. Um, we haven't gotten to the point where we're, you know, looking to change anything right now for the fall, but it doesn't mean that time it doesn't come up. The, these might be some of the conversations that we have together so that um, we, we come up with the best solution and we come up with one that feels that we feel will be embraced, um, you know, having, after having given a, a lot of thought and, and, and conversation. Um, the calendar is one of those things that has been brought up. Other states are thinking about it as well. Um, so while there's nothing set in stone right now that, that I can share with you that will happen before the fall, I will share with you that there have been conversations about how we can look at the calendar differently and maybe is this an opportunity for us to, to do, uh, provide a little bit more consistency throughout the state. Great. Uh, along those same lines, you know, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve McKeever in just a second. Um, you know, 
we have the laws that say that you know students must be in school for a hundred a minimum of 180 days 900 hours you know you break that down it's about 90 hours per month um, but now that we have the distance learning we have the in-school learning um, reimagining you know what that formula would look like right. um, and at this point, I, we've had a lot of discussions with this group about you know, those type of things. And I just want to turn it over to Steve so some of his thoughts. Hey, good morning, everybody. Commissioner, it's good to see you. Same here, Steve. Um, nice to see you. You know, I think you hit it right on the head earlier when you said, um, if we make a schedule that fits for one district, the next town over is not going to do it. You know, um, it's just, it's for every, and we've all been talking about this for months, but for every schedule we can think of, we can come up with a dozen different reasons it's problematic, you know? And so, you know, there, I'm saying that because I recognize the difficulty that you're going through. You know, I worry about it from you know, Middletown area, but then, then, you know, you're looking at it from the whole state. So one of the things that we had thought about, and Jan mentioned it just now, was maybe doing, instead of the state dictating the type of schedule to districts, just these are the hours, you know, and one of the things that I had, we had come up with was maybe a 45 hours a month as a minimum, you know, and, and some districts uh, do seven hours a day, they'll be able to hit 56 according to a plan I'll show you in a second. Um, but that just might be a way to, to help sort it out with them. Um, I'm going to share my, whoops, hold on one second. I got to share my screen with you guys. I want to show you, um, I believe that Jan had shared these uh, possible schedules with you. And can you guys all see this okay? Yep. Right. Yes. Um, so, you know, in planning going forward, we had thought about different possibilities uh, and not doing a, a dictated schedule um, from the state, but different ideas. Uh, so if you go with like maybe a 45 hours, like you said, we can do alternating days, we can do alternating weeks, um, and I'm going to call them A-B schedules. And then going through and looking at it on this first page, you'll see there's some pros and cons. I'm not going to read them because you've got them all. But one of the nice things I like about the schedule that we've been playing with for the alternating things uh, is the parents know exactly what days their kids are going to be in school. Therefore, they can then plan for daycare or whatever else they have to they have to do instead of trying to be in willy nilly. And I was kind of hoping we could get that in there. If we're in school on a regular basis, meeting the IEP hours and um, those kind of accommodations becomes a lot easier. Uh, every other days or every other week might be more efficient for busing, you know, cause we've heard a lot of different plans and these are just some of the things, you know, and then obviously, like I said, with everything, um, you're going to have problems alternating days and weeks. You can get COVID to start to, ramp back up again. Um, so that's what there. So here's this next page is just an option. And I'm going to call it AA and BB. So what that means is we're going to take the group, the, the group, split your, your student population in half. Um, and that'll be the A group. So what I did was I work in a middle school. And you can see seven R seven, eight, these are the team letters, everybody's got something slightly different. But if you take the team and you split it in half, um, so that on Monday and Tuesday, this 7R1, these two kids, this cohort comes to school for two days in a row. The other half of that team is 7R2. They go on Thursday and Friday for two days in a row. And we thought about putting a Wednesday as a, a day off for cleaning purposes. Um, but you'll see a little bit later down, I'll show you a teacher schedule where teachers don't have a lot of meetings during the day while the kids are in school. It was a way to, to get more availability for the students. Um, but you put all your meetings, faculty meetings, PD, uh, things like that. Now this could all be done virtual. We could stay home and we can all zoom to do our meetings and our planning um, while the custodial staff cleans. Uh, we had an idea of maybe doing Monday through fr Thursday with the Friday off. Um, so some people said, well, maybe Wednesday's better, but I mean, it could be, that can be adjusted for every district can do their own way. Or if you want to talk about a, a state schedule, you can state could say, okay, Wednesday schools are closed. Everybody knows it. We can plan for it. Um, but that's up for discussion on that one. 
So I just have a question. If I'm a student on the um, seven hour team one, yeah. So I go, I come in Monday, Tuesday, distance learning Wednesday. What happens to me on Thursday, Friday? The, you're, you're doing the distance learning on these days. So you're going to be home. Um, and we were thinking that you might have some teachers that can't come in for immune purposes. Maybe they could be responsible for the distance learning. We can set it up for the, um, the paraprofessionals, paraeducators can help out with that. Let me skip down real quick. And then I'll come back up to my teacher, a sample teacher schedule. So when you look here, this is just a sample of what I would do. So I'd have class and then I got my break and then class with a lunch. But I have been able to get in here this office hour because I took the meetings out and put them all on Monday, I mean on Wednesday. This one hour, 50 minutes, I'm sitting at my desk online with the kids that are not in school. You know, so they can check in with the various teachers on their distance learning days. Instead of trying to, to zoom into a classroom while I'm teaching, because for most classes, I don't see how they could do a live zoom in while I'm trying to teach. You know, I'm thinking about uh, lab classes, you know, these specialty classes where the, the teachers, and, and very few teachers just stand and lecture. There's always a lot going on. Um, but this would give me an opportunity to do an, a lesson um, such as a flipped classroom. So I teach STEM and maybe I have the kids doing something on electronics where they're building the circuits and testing on Monday. And then I give them their assignment to go home. And on Tuesday they're home and they're looking up various laws of electronics, Ohm's laws and volts and all of that. And then they can call in during my office hours and I can talk to them. How are you doing with your assignment to try to keep them on a regular basis? Did that answer your question? Got it. Thank you. Okay. So let me scroll back up. This is the one that we were looking at. Okay. So now we did a, we did a AB, AB. So instead of the kids being out for two days in a row, it's every other day kind of a thing. Okay. So take the same seven R one, but this would be seven R one. And then Tuesday would be seven R two. Okay. So what you see on this one is the two day schedule. This particular group says Monday and Thursday. So these kids are in class on Monday and they're in class on Thursday. This next count, this is the 7R2 group. They're in school on Tuesday and they're in school on Fridays. Okay. Um, and then I also played around with some of my elementary teacher friends and how we could plan out um, some of the specials. And what's very important to the elementary teacher with the specials, that's how you get their prep times so that they can plan for stuff but we can get the specialty courses, PE, art, music, uh, library, whatever else is there can be scheduled in. And I have a couple of different ideas. I didn't want to overwhelm a calendar with 17 ideas. I, I mean, these are things that yeah, yeah. every district would have to think about kind of on their, on their own. Um, and again, you know, I put in the Wednesday was the, the middle of the week cleaning day. We just thought maybe it's an opportunity instead of letting the germs grow for four and a half days, that you get to them in the middle, but that can be moved, whatever works for districts. We played around with different ideas of maybe doing three on and two off, you know, like an alternating thing. Um, but that really got to be a headache because one week the kid would be in school for three days, the next week he would be in for two. And then what if you got a, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're done with this by November, but what if you get a snow day in there and you screw everything? It became very difficult for, for us to try to figure out how can parents plan for daycare and then how do we plan and if the kid you know it'd be possible we don't see a student for 10 days depending on you know if all the, 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 mm. the things line up incorrectly okay so this last page um i'll just go over it again it's a sample teacher schedule um a couple of things that would have to happen for this is obviously the classes become a little bit shorter we get them all on the same day you just go over and over and over again um, that would be the downside is it kind of goes back to what we used to do in, in days of seven classes, 45 minutes, everybody come in, you know, so it goes against a little bit of the reimagine idea, the innovation that a lot of people are doing. But I think for the time being, we can stay on task. We can keep the kids going. And then once we're all back into school, we can just keep building and develop. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but I really like being able to do this and have these office hours. And, you know, each district, each school building going to have to manipulate it. Obviously, we're not going to ask the kids to log into teachers all day long, but it's an opportunity for them to check in. One of the things that we found in the distance learning now, um, pretty easily 20% of our students across the state and districts that I've seen and, and have read about is that they're just not checking in. They're not there. If we can put something in there regularly, Monday you come to class, on Tuesday you're checking in, you know, Thursday you're in class, Friday you're checking in, to try to keep some kind of uh, uh, consistency with these students. You know, and the other thing that we saw is that the middle-aged kids, that, that secondary kids that do a lot of Xbox time, a lot of video games, their sleep patterns got all crazy. They're staying up in the middle of the night, face to, you know. And at least if we can try to be consistent and keep them, you have to check in, um, that might help try to keep them on a regular schedule so that when we do get back to school, it's not as much of a, a culture shock. Right. One thing I did want to put out is that we think that maybe we should have some kind of plan that goes out, or I think that it should go out like August 1st, um, because this kind of an alternating schedule in some of the bigger districts might become difficult uh, for uh, if, if you, you have a teenage son who's responsible for babysitting the eight-year-old, but they go to school on opposite days. Um, so by, if we can have this out by like maybe August 1st and say, however the district wants to do it by street name or by alphabet, you can say all these kids are coming to school on Monday and all these kids are coming on Tuesday. And then that gives the individual parents an opportunity to say, wait a minute, you got a conflict between my son and my daughter, call the principals and can we work it out? You know, um, I think every plan we have, there's going to be conflict somewhere, but you know, let's try to get it to, there's an opportunity in there, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, and, you know, I'll just go out on a limb and speak for myself for a minute because we had some ideas of maybe not starting it on the lines of a school calendar. What if we started after Labor Day, but all the school teachers had to come back at their normal time, such as August, whatever it is, 25th. That gives the principals and the schedulers an extra week, uh, maybe even 10 days, uh, depending on how you look at it, to actually plan for how we're going through to actually get the schedules in place for the kids and for the parents. Some of these parents may be on vacation in the beginning of August, so they're not going to be back. And I mean, we know how many people sign up and come into school a week late as well. So that maybe we can do that. It's just a thought. It was there. Yeah. Um, and this is all of my scheduling ideas. I'm open to any kind of questions or discussion. Steve, I, I first of all, I want to just say, like, I could tell how much time and energy went into this. Um, you know, especially middle school schedules and high school schedules are so challenging. Right. The fact that you really went through, put different options is, is appreciated. Um, and I'll mention that, you know, if, speaking from a parent's perspective, the office hours, um, when over the last three months, my, my children relied on office hours to get specific questions answered when, when synchronous learning wasn't possible. Um, so that, that personalization was possible. And I'll share that, you know, we, we, it's funny, we vacillated back and forth between the degree of specificity or the parameters and then let, let folks come out with innovative ideas like this to address what the needs are in the community. And I think someone else brought it up too, that this plan would affect the neighboring community also, right? Because if there's a teacher that works in one community and has to think about childcare options, they would have to do so. Um, and the impact on the teacher, let's say I, I, I work next door, but I, my kids attend this district, um, there would be an impact there. So you brought out, and I think you said it best, that there's no perfect solution. And we have to recognize that um, even if the health improvements are give us confidence to bring as many students as possible back, whatever precautionary measures or whatever adjustments between districts, they're going to have a, a multi-district impact. Um, that's a good example. Your plan is a very good example of the level of specificity that's going to be needed in these conversations and, and the pros and the cons. Um, one of the things that we're considering is how are we giving districts that opportunity to think about a variety of plans and have on their shelf plans so that if the health indications 
the health indicators tell us we have to ramp down or provide more opportunity for distance learning, what does that look like? You know, so it's not an all or nothing type of thing. And a plan like that, having that available, I, I'm thinking having well thought out plans like that one available for all districts to examine and, and make them fit for theirs is something that we've had a lot of conversation about and we need to consider because the hours that you spent on that with your elementary partners, you know, you might be the person that for more information, contact so-and-so, you've done the thinking there. There might be models out there for high schools. Um, there, there might be models for elementary schools that have given thought to a similar framework if an AB is something that a district needs. Um, so I appreciate the time that went into that, the clear explanation and understand that this is part of the reason why we know one size doesn't fit all. Because as districts, so there might be a district that has a high spread and they might have to engage something like that where a district that has no spread might not be needing something like that. You know, you know what I'm saying? So um, having that at, at, at teacher's disposal, at district's disposal is, is I think what we see our role to be as well so that um, we can take advantage of everyone's collective thinking and the time that they put into it. Right, and that was, Thank I mean, that was why it was so important that when we, st when we came up with the 45 hours, that would be a minimum. Right, right, right. If you right. have a district that can go back to school for more, then then good, they're going to do it. And and but a forty five, that's I forget what I did to get that math. I think it was only six hours or something, which I don't believe anybody goes to school for only six hours. Um, but by putting in a minimum, gave that kind of flexibility to adjust from one district to another. Like you're saying, if somebody if they yeah. can go to school, then you you give it to them. And I think across the country, what I'm hearing is, you know, they're the fluidity. I mean, we like to have our schedule set. I used right. to create schedules over the summer and, you know, by my goal was like by July 1st, have it done, share it with teachers, share it with the, you know, the school community so that people knew what they were doing. They could plan accordingly. We, we're being challenged in education right. to not be able to count on that because if you think you're going to have a schedule set now, it's going to be harder for us to, to shift when, you know, COVID chooses to shift. Right. The goal, we're all hoping and, and praying that the trends that we see in Connecticut continue, right? Another challenge, Steve, that I think is, is worthwhile to share here is we're almost having to predict where we're going to be. I can't say, you know, the plan is not meant for tomorrow. The plan is meant for two months from now. So what, what do we have? We have the data of where we're going in Connecticut. And so far, one, Connecticut is one of three or four states that's trending in the right direction. We have to use that, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that if that changes, we also have to change our plans. So I think that's the challenge in education. And everybody recognizes planning for fall reopening is a, an extremely challenging thing and one that's gonna require flexibility and adaptability. And, and you know, your plan shows that and I appreciate you sharing that. In great detail. And I just wanted to uh, to add, Commissioner, and thank you for that. It, it's clear that you spend a lot of time uh, on bringing that through. I'll overlay on that uh, the issue that we also continue to talk about uh, and try to solve for is devices and connectivity, uh, right? In in the midst of looking at the ability to quickly switch to you know a day on or a day off. Uh, with her students, and I, you know, I know Desi and, and others are working on that, so that's there. Uh, and uh, I'll share with you, uh, it's interesting, America's Promise, and some of you may have seen the National Representative uh, Survey that they did recently with about 3,300 students, 13 through 19, and they landed on issues about mental health and, and what students are saying in terms of engagement and what they're looking for. It's interesting because when we look at our own thought exchange here, it mirrors that uh, in Connecticut. And I shared with you earlier uh, that, you know, one uh, thought that stood out to me looking through what students are saying is that a student voice in Connecticut that said student look forward to school as a reason to get out of bed, uh, you know, in the mornings. And so when we hear those voices and what they're doing, uh, how we uh, try to support them uh, as I know you're, you're concerned about as well in their learning is so critically important. So it just shows the complexity 
uh, of, of the issues uh, that we're all grappling with, but certainly appreciate uh, the thinking about reimagining, you know, what school looks like on a daily basis. So I think um, that brings us to, we do have an ask of you. Um, you saw the, the work that Steve put into one plan that may work for his building or his district. And we know we have a lot of really talented educators like Steve out there. And the ask is, would you consider bringing those folks together? Um, maybe breaking them up by pre-K or elementary school, middle school and high school, um, AFT members, CEA members, maybe um, superintendent, something like that with your own teams. And just looking at all the different possibilities that these really talented people, the ideas that they have and kind of putting that, that binder of solutions together. Is that something that um, the State Department would be open to? Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't need to get into that much further. Uh, it would behoove us as a state to do that. Um, I would say yes on a statewide level. Uh, we have to think about how we're warehousing best ideas and connections and just kind of be a repository to support districts. But I would also argue that we feel strongly that um, you know, as districts are thinking about this work, that they also incorporate various perspectives, including uh, the perspectives of teachers who have been, you know, scratching their heads and thinking about this and know the buildings, know the schedules as well. So two prong answer to that is yes, statewide level conversations, logistics, but also encouragement of that also being the case in local districts. So I want to open it up. I know I took a lot of time on most of the questions. Um, if anybody else on my team has a question that they would like to ask. So a lot of the questions that came from our teachers, obviously the safety of students and staffs in their community is always number one. Um, another one that we've had many discussions for is equity, equity um, being funds and resources. You know, Steve said that each district has its own uniqueness and things that they need. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we'd love to say that all of those things are available to, uh, to every district, but we know that resources aren't there too. So you know, going forward, how, what, what that looks like. Sure. So I know we've, uh, we've sent out applications Friday to districts for their CARES funds. So there's 111 million coming in to the state. Uh, about 100 of that is going directly to districts, right, based on need. Uh, so that will help. There's uh, FEMA funds and coronavirus uh, relief funds that are also being made available uh, to districts. And we know that equity, I mean, we had equity gaps prior, right? They've been exacerbated. And, and that's something that we're trying to hold on to, too, to say, how do we put a plan forward? Number one, that's, uh, you know, that, that our, our health partners are, are supporting, right? Or they're, they're uh, guiding um, to make sure that we're taking those precautions that we need to take to get students into school, but also the experience that students are having. How can we ensure quality? And as Desi mentioned earlier, the, the uh, learning hub that's being developed, this is something that we never had that we created in the last month because we recognized that, you know, if remote learning is a part of a kid's plan, we need to make sure that there's some quality content that they can access and that teachers can access. You know, we, we often talk about what teachers give to their classrooms. They, they spend money on different materials, but time too. You know, you take time away from your day, from your family, to create materials so that you can have them ready for the next day. We want to create, like Steve was talking about, a repository of good, good plans, a repository of good quality materials for teachers to access that align with uh, high quality standards so that it's not just uh, different assignments in different places, it's connected. We're trying to do that to promote equity throughout the state of Connecticut, not only because of COVID, but even after COVID, because we had work to do before COVID. Um, I was going to ask about funding um, in particular. My principal is heading the Tiger team in New Haven, and he was particularly concerned about personnel for temperature taking and whatever other um, uh, checking of students coming in. We have 44 buildings, mm. so it's not a small personnel issue. And he was wondering if there would be any funds earmarked for the larger districts to be able to you know, perform those kinds of safety measures. Thank you for the question, Marianne. Um, the work that we're doing to get this plan out will require that districts, you know, begin planning and, and, 
you know, we'll, we'll hear, we'll see, it'll rise to the surface the needs of the inequities based on what's required, right? So some things may not be required, um, but the things that are required, it might, re it might need additional funds or, or uh, focusing in particular districts. There are, I think, between um, the three largest districts, there are like 60,000 students. So we have to think about what impact it has on different districts. And there's some districts that have 300 kids. There's some districts that have 10,000. You know, so we have to be prepared to listen to how the impacts are in, in those districts. And you know, the process of uh, rolling out will include listening to what the needs are in the districts and how we can best support. Because I think it gets to that whole equity point, right? We want to make sure all students have the same uh, ability to benefit from precautionary measures that are, um, you know, implemented. Now, again. The requirements and and what we, what we recommend may be two different things. So what might have been required two months ago when we were learning things may not necessarily be a requirement moving forward. Along those same lines Thank of you. equity, I know uh, almost everybody in this group has mentioned before that you know we're concerned about our paraeducators moving forward too. You know we we know the work that they do and we see them getting laid off in other states like New York and Massachusetts. Um, and they're needed to help and support yes, yeah. our, our educative force. Um, and so one of the things that um, comes up on an IEP a lot is um, it used to say uh, the number of students per para, it used to be defined, um, and now it just says small group. And so one of the um, things that has been asked is, you know, is it possible for the State Department to define small group again? Can we go back to you know, maybe three, I don't, I, I don't know what the magic number is. Right, right, right. Instead of saying a small group, actually identify, you know, what is possible for a para. Um, and, and so that we make sure people know that they are needed um, very, very much um, in order to continue with quality education. When I used to, uh, I was fortunate enough to serve as an elementary school principal, and we, used, we would have uh, para educator meetings mm -hmm. and they'd call, come to the cap. And, and I'd always start to say the conversation by saying, um, you know, for this next hour, you're going to be more appreciated than ever before because you're not in the classrooms. They <laughs> play such a critical role in a school's success, in student success. You know, when we know distance learning, when students were able to connect with teachers and all that, in many cases, they also wanted to connect with paraeducators because those are the folks that are working uh, closely with them. So I just want to underscore the importance of paraeducators and, and the functioning of our public schools and in the success of our learners in Connecticut. And I agree that we have to uh, recognize that as we're planning forward. Um, so with regard to that specific question about uh, IEPs or how they're defined, I would say that perhaps that's a conversation that could happen with our uh, special education team to see you know, what impact that has or what considerations we should think about as we give guidance or even create regulations or, or more formal expectations. Um, but thank you for sharing that. And part of the conversation that we're going to continue to have with AFT and our other partners is, listen, what do we have to think about now? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What do we have to think about where we can have conversation? In some cases, it might be just guidance. In some cases, it might be more defined direction. Um, that might be one of those topics that we can continue to have, kind of like TVAL and assessments will be. Great. I think we have time for one more, uh, Dan. I know at noon, uh, my I colleagues and I have... Yep, I think uh, Lauren has her hand raised and then we can wrap it up. Thank you. Lauren? And it's not about T Val Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to go back to the conversation about technology and I just wanted to point something out and then have you maybe say something. But a lot of our um, teachers and para educators have been embarrassed that they either don't have internet at their home or don't have mm. a reliable device. So I would love to see or hear you say that you're gonna pay attention particularly to those people because they're not very vocal because they're embarrassed to be in this situation because they think it um, comes back to the fact that they don't make a lot of money or they don't have a lot of money or they find themselves living paycheck to paycheck and that's just not an option for them. Lauren, I appreciate you bringing that up and being the voice because I've heard it in different places and I think what we have to do is be conscious when we message that we, if we're, if we're expecting quality remote learning, and you might hear me say that our remote learning 2.0 has to be better than 1.0. That's not to say that teachers didn't bend over back. As a matter of fact, they probably have to work harder than ever 
because of those things that you just mentioned. But we need to evolve our thinking in our state as what does quality distance learning will look like. And part of that is making sure that our teachers have the tools that they need to do that. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up, point noted, and I think that's something that we have to also be a little bit more clear. Not, not that districts aren't thinking about that because I, I've heard from districts saying, I have to provide laptops for my teachers too because I want them to deliver. Um, but I think it's something that it's worth repeating and, and being part of our messaging. Um, you know, I had a conversation recently with the commissioners of the whole country and we like a Zoom call kind of like this. And there were some commissioners that live so remotely that their signal was bad <laughs> and they couldn't even engage in conversation because they might live in the woods somewhere in, in Montana. And it, it, you know, it brought to, to, brought to my mind the fact that if we're going to consider remote learning as part of our process, then we need to make sure that infrastructure is set up. I won't take a lot of time on this, but we're, we're part of a uh, rapid response team that the governor has for connectivity. We have um, devoted as much as possible of any funds that we can control to the devices and the connectivity piece. And we need to make sure that we're acknowledging the fact that for some of our educators that need to connect with students, we have to also think about them in this process. Um, so I'm going to pause there. I mean, I could go on, but I didn't want to. But thank you, Lauren, for, for bringing that up. I would just add, Commissioner uh, Lauren, just so you're aware, we are looking at um, using the Learning Hub to provide professional development opportunities to, to teachers and parents for things like that. So please know that we are having those discussions internally and looking at how we can use um, our Learning Hub to provide those opportunities to teachers statewide. Thank you for bringing that up. Jan and I, since, since coming on, Jan and I have had open conversations regularly. I mean, I, there's at least once a week we're meeting uh, since COVID. One of the last district visits that I made was in partnership with her. We toured a building together um, to check out different, you know, learning going on. I do feel that the partnership is what we're going to need in order for the best results for our learners. Um, I want I want you to understand that this is not just an event. This is how we do business at the agency prior to COVID and it's going to happen long after COVID. So it's critically important that, that I reiterate that. Um, you know, and the reopening plan, as you know, it's going to be, you know, I was talking to colleagues, it's, we're going to do the very best we can with the data that we have now and project forward knowing that many of the answers lies with the folks that are in the districts that are thinking about what it looks like for a middle school, what it looks like for an elementary school. We're, we're going to be, um, we're going to be receiving the guidance. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> we're going to be receiving the guidance of our, um, of our health and safety folks too, to make sure that those considerations are being, are guiding the work and the planning. And not only now where we have to predict two months out, but, as we get closer to the opening, we're going to make sure that the data from our uh, health experts and the data that we're learning about COVID spread or lack of spread is going to guide the work. And it's a challenge. Um, it's something that I think keeps us all up at night. But we're confident that if we continue with that shared approach and that listening, that we're going to get the best results for our kids in Connecticut. And not only that, I think if we continue this approach, when we're when it's all said and done, I think we're gonna reimagine we're gonna have reimagined so many components of education that we're gonna be so proud of and that can serve as models throughout the country. So it's a long-term partnership. As long as I'm commissioner of education, know that um, you know we're gonna continue to work together and we're gonna continue to partner. And there are no easy answers here. There are no easy answers. If there were, you would have it already. But we're committed to doing the best we can and continuing to re revisit our plans so that it's a constant process to help our learners in Connecticut achieve their potential. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for that. And Everyone. I apologize, my computer just poof. Stuart and I are gonna have to have a talk after this because I think he booted me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, You're kind of getting back to Lauren's point. We need technology distribution. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, thank goodness we're in the office today. But I did just want to um, say thank you to you and your team 
um, like you mentioned, we have been having these conversations since since you began yeah. um, as commissioner, and it's just been an awesome relationship. And you have included us in every step of the process along the way, and we look forward to continuing with that. And especially like we ask, you know, that working group so that our teachers' voices can be heard. Um, they do have that knowledge. They, you know, and they just want their voices to be heard. So we thank you for everything that you're doing and for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you all. Nice to thank see you, you all. Too. Keep smiling. <laughs>